Good evening, friends, family, and those that are watching us on the internet, on Facebook. We come to you tonight, and we're going to be teaching some interesting things. For the last several weeks on Wednesday night, we've been teaching about different religious cults, and tonight we're going to continue. I'd have to say tonight, the name of our subject tonight would be Islam. Is it a religion, or is it a cult? And I'm going to give you some history. We're going to do some comparative things, what they believe compared to what the Bible teaches. There may be some similarities, but you're going to find the truth before we're finished tonight. So, here we go. I'd like to tell you that Islam began in Mecca. And it claimed to be the revelation of God, Allah, through the angel Gabriel, to a man named Muhammad. Muhammad was born approximately in A.D. 570 to 571. He was born to the powerful tribe of the Quraysh in Mecca. His father's name was Abdullah, and his mother's name was Amana. Apparently, Abdullah was a merchant who made caravan trips. He died on a trading trip soon after his marriage to Amina, leaving Muhammad fatherless at birth. Amina, his mother, died when Muhammad was only six years old. Muhammad was taken in by his grandfather, only to have him die when Muhammad was eight years old. And at this time, his uncle Abu Talib, one of the leaders of the Quraysh tribe, took him in and raised him. Now I'm giving you information right from their site information that they've given up publicly. Muhammad was taught the family business and apparently was quite successful. A wealthy widow named Kajida, I think that's pronounced correctly, arranged for Muhammad to oversee her trading business and was so impressed with his skill and appearance that she proposed marriage to him. Muhammad was 25 and Kajida was 40 when they married. They had six children two boys and four girls. Both of the sons died early in life, but the daughters lived to see Muhammad become the father, founder of Islam. Having married the wealthy Kajida, Mahaba now became a gentleman of leisure and somewhat of a philosopher. Isn't that what money will do for you sometimes? You sit back and relax. He would retreat from society and take trips into the desert and mountains. He would spend his hours in meditation, supposedly, and he was greatly concerned about the condition of the civilization he saw around him. He had a personal mission to try to find truth. One of his frequent places of seclusion was in a cave on Mount Nur. That's N-U-R. It was while in this cave during the month of the Ramadan, a pagan festival, that he received his first visitation, supposedly, from Gabriel. And he recited these verses, and they're found in the Quran, which is the book of Islam, in 96 verses 1 through 5. At first, Muhammad shared his new revelations with his only family and close friends. And during the next three years, the message of Muhammad quietly spread among the people of Mecca, especially among the youth. Then Muhammad is believed to have received instructions from Allah to go public with his message and openly condemn the paganism and idolatry of Mecca. This open condemnation of idolatry became an economic threat to the prosperity of Mecca and as a consequence, organized opposition to Muhammad and Islam began. At this point, Islam was politically weak and many Muslims died for their faith. Persecutions became so great that many Muslims fled to Abyssinia, which is Ethiopia, for refuge. When Meccan delegates tried to extradite them after hearing the Muslims' defense, the ruler refused their extradition on the basis that his faith was similar to theirs, and he would not allow them to be harmed. Muhammad continued to proclaim his message, and his following slowly grew. At one point in 621 AD, a group of delegates from Medina responded to his call, and he could not allow them to be harmed. Muhammad continued to proclaim his message, 
and it continued to grow. A year later, in 622, some people, about 70 from Medina, made a similar declaration and pledged to fight to protect Muhammad against any and all odds. This pledge or covenant from some who were leaders of Medina was a turning point for Islam. It provided Muslims with a secure base of operations and allowed them to expand from it. Muhammad commanded the Muslims in Mecca to migrate to Medina. But after some struggle, Medina was declared to be wholly a Muslim community. For 13 years, Muhammad had preached in Mecca with minimal success. He followed a quiet, non-political approach and merely preached. But now, however, his tactics changed. He established himself as religious, political, and military leader. And under his guidance, the community of believers became more important than family or tribe. Islam began to spread through intimidation and force, and entire tribes and cities were converted under threat of war or by conquest. Success led to greater success, and in the year 630, eight years after he'd been forced to leave Mecca, Muhammad returned with such an overwhelming force that the Meccans made no res resistance at all. Muhammad's forces destroyed all the idols of Mecca and declared the Kaaba to be the place of worship for Allah. And with the subjugation of Mecca, Islam became the power on the Arabian Peninsula. Tribe after tribe, city after city declared allegiance to Islam and its prophet. They were given no choice. Muhammad returned to Medina and continued to rule his kingdom from there. Muhammad died in 632 at the age of 63. In 23 years, he established a religion and social order that is still dominant in the Arab world today. It's quite successful, isn't it? With Muhammad's death, Islam continued to flourish under the leadership of Muhammad's companions. The first caliph, which is the successor to the prophet, called the Khalifa, was his father-in-law and longtime friend Abu Bakr. In his two years of leadership, Abu Bakr consolidated the Islamic influence over the entire Arabian Peninsula. The second caliph was Umar. He was in power from 634 to, 6, 634 to 644. And under Umar, Syria, Mesopotamia, Egypt, and Persia were added to the growing list of Islamic subjects. Others followed, continually expanding the borders of Islam into Europe, Africa, and Asia. The caliphate lasted centuries, shifting from one dynasty to another, but always claiming the religious right to leave. Eventually, the caliphate evolved into the Ottoman Empire, which lasted until the early 20th century. Islam spread as a social system a political system and a religious system and it was spread by force of arms. In other words, you're going to do it or die. That was its philosophy in the beginning and it is still the philosophy of Islam today. Today, Islam is one of the world's dominant religions and claims as much as one-fifth of the world's population. That's a lot of people and it continues. And I will say this, their families have many, many children whereas many Christians abort their babies or don't have children at all. They have propagated what they, they teach and they teach that you need to multiply. I remember reading in the book of Genesis that God said to the people, be fruitful and multiply. So they are expanding while Christianity is decreasing. Today, Islam claims to be a united religion with no divisions, however, one does not have to be an astute observer to realize that Islam is in reality fragmented into many different branches, some of which are militantly hostile to each other. There is no unity among Muslims as they would have us believe. There's two prominent groups, the Shiites and the Sunnites, and they had their origins around 660 over who was the legitimate caliph and other sects followed. <coughs> With the end of this colonial system, Islamic states were given their autonomy again with the wealth from petrodollars. Islam, 
as religion is being successfully spread over the world, Islam is one of the fastest and greatest opponents in existence the gospel of Christ today and is one of the fastest growing religions in the entire world. I want to tell you one thing that they teach about Jesus. We're going to go into more of it. The Muslims teach that Judas, not Jesus, was crucified on the cross. Yes, that's right, Judas. And it was a case of mistaken identity. Muslims teach that Judas Iscariot, the betrayer and thief, is the real savior of Christians. Muslims teach that it was actually Judas who actually died on the cross, and because Judas had a similar physical appearance to Jesus, even his own mother didn't recognize him as he wept at the foot of the cross. As for 600 years, Christians have been preaching Christ crucified. Then Muhammad comes along, jumps off his camel, and gets a direct revelation from God that the universal record of history and the 10,000 manuscripts of the Bible are all wrong. The idea that Judas was crucified instead of Christ is so outrageous, no educated person would consider it. Even atheists, modernists, and Bible haters who reject the resurrection of Christ consider Muhammad's story of the cross nothing other than a myth and contrary to the undisputed facts of history. So there we are on some of the beginnings of Islam and where it came from. And of course, like I said, it's the fastest growing religion in the world. And that's sad to say, as a Christian, I would like to be able to say that Christianity is spreading but it isn't. Many, many churches do not even propagate the, the gospel. They don't even give altar calls. They don't even ask people if they're born again. They just come in and they have a good time. There's social churches. There's no change. They don't deal with sin. But I'm going to tell you, some of the things that the Muslims do are actually pretty interesting. A friend of mine was over in an African country, and some Muslims came into a church where he was at because there had been a miracle. A young boy had fallen and hit his head and was in a coma. I believe that's the story. And my friend had prayed for this boy and there was no medicine and he was healed. I don't remember the exact results of it, but he was healed. And many of the tribe were Muslims and they came in to see what was going on. And they said to this man, they said, well, we pray five times a day. He said, well, I pray, I pray all day long. And then they said, well, we don't smoke. And he said, well, I don't smoke. And they said, we don't drink. And he said, I don't drink either. So they listened to what he had to say, and all of these men came to know Jesus Christ as their Savior through that miracle. You see, in many ways, they're clean, loving people, and in other ways, they're not. And we're going to get into a little bit more of that tonight. But isn't it amazing? that one man walking the straight and narrow was able to see a miracle happen and all these people got saved. But it is, Islam being the fastest growing religion, they say it's a religion of peace. Is it a violence or is it both? Muhammad taught that there is one God, no trinity. He taught that Jesus was not crucified and that good works are needed for salvation. The Quran is the Muslim's holy book, and it contains a wide variety of topics. The hadith are the deeds and sayings of Muhammad, and they are authoritative in the average Muslim's life. They contain volumes of material, some of which is hard to believe. All in all, Islam is an important religion begun by Muhammad over 1,400 years ago. Some consider it a Christian heresy, others a new false religion, but for Muslims, they believe it's the revelation of their God. So let's talk about what some of their doctrines are. Now, this is all reference from the Quran, and I will give you the quotes from it. First of all, about believing about God. They believe there's only one God. That comes from the Quran 5, verse 73, and 112, verses 1 through 4. They believe God is called Allah by Muslims. They also believe that Allah sees all things in 40, verse 20, and that he's present everywhere. That's in 2, page 115, and 7, page 7. They believe Allah is the sole creator and sustainer of the universe. They believe Allah is not a trinity, but is one. They believe that Allah is all-knowing. That's in chapter 2, 
verse 268 out of the Quran in 10 and 61. We also believe that, that God is all-powerful. That comes from chapter 6, verses 61 and 62. They believe that Allah created the heaven and the earth. And that comes from chapter 2, verse 29, chapter 6, verse 1, and 73. Chapter 25, 61 through 62. Chapter 36, 81. And 46, verse 33. This is what they believe about salvation and judgment. They believe that Allah will judge all people on the day of judgment. That comes from the Quran, chapter 3, verse 30. Chapter 35, verse 33 through 37. Chapter 99, verses 6 through 8. They also believe if your good deeds exceed your bad deeds, and you believe in Allah, and sincerely repent of sins, you may go to heaven. That comes from chapter 3, verse 135, chapter 7, verses 8 and 9, chapter 21, verse 7, 47, chapter 49, verse 14, chapter 66, 8 and 9. Now remember, I'm quoting these things right from the Quran. They also believe there's an eternal hell for those who are not Muslims and not practicing Islam and not of their true faith. That comes from chapter 3, verse 77. They also believe hell is a place of unlimited capacity. That comes from chapter 50, verse 30. It's a place of eternal torment. Chapter 2, verse 39, 14, verse 17, 25, verse 65, 39, 27. They believe there's fire there. They believe there's boiling water in hell. That's chapter 38, 55 through 58 verses. They believe where your skin is burned and renewed, and it's for unbelievers and the jinn, J-I-N-N, -N, with faces covered with fire. They believe there is a tree in hell named the tree of Zakum, from which bad fruit is given and the damned are forced to eat. That comes from chapter 37, verses 62 through 67. They believe in heaven or paradise. They believe a garden which is in chapter 79, verse 41. They believe the garden is bliss and fruit and has rivers, chapter 3, verse 198, with maidens pure and holy, chapter 4, verse 57. And it has carpets and cushions, chapter 88, 8 through 16. They believe there will be a physical resurrection of all people on the day of judgment. That comes from chapter 3, verse 77, chapter 15, 25, and others. They believe judgment is based on a person's sincere repentance and their righteous deeds. Now, some of these other things they believe, they believe there's an afterlife. Chapter 2, verse 154. They believe there are such things as angels created by Allah that are created from light. They believe angels are obedient slaves, incapable of refusing to do Allah's will. The angel Gabriel, they believe, brought the revelation of the Quran to Muhammad. That's chapter 2, verse 97. They believe <coughs> that the Holy Spirit is the angel Gabriel. Chapter 2, verse 97, and 16, verses 102. They believe there's no actual verse where the Holy Spirit is said to be Gabriel or is identified in Gabriel, that these verses show that both the Holy Spirit and Gabriel brought down the revelation because it wasn't said. They also believe jinn are unseen beings that were created from fire, chapter 15, verse 27, and 55, verse 15, but are not angels. They have communities. They are good and bad jinn. They also believe there's a devil called Iblis, and it's a bad jinn. That comes from chapter 2, verse 34 of the Quran. They believe Jesus was a great prophet, but not the Son of God. They believe he's not divine and that he was not crucified. That comes from chapter 4, verses 157. They believe that Muhammad is Allah's greatest and lost prophet, and his message supersedes all other prophets, including Jesus. They believe the Quran is Allah's word. He literally spoke it to Gabriel, who gave it to Muhammad. Now, if you remember the book of Galatians, it says if an angel or anybody comes to you with something different than what they've been preached, that it's anathema. You're not to believe it. The ninth thing they believe is there are other holy writings, but they're all superseded by the Quran. But the other books are the Torah, the first five books of Moses, the Angel, the message that Jesus gave, written down but no longer exists, 
And then they believe that the writings have been altered by scholars, and whatever agrees, agrees with the Quran is true. They also believe in the Zubur, which is the Psalms. They also believe in preordainment, well, Qatar, is the teaching that all things good and bad are preordained to, to occur. It means there's no choice over it. They believe fasting is to, to be observed during the month of Ramadan. That comes from chapter 2, verse 185. That drinking alcohol is forbidden. Chapter 2, 219, 4, verse 43, 5, 93 through 94, and 16, verse 67. They believe gambling is forbidden. That comes from chapter 2 of the Quran, verse 219. Chapter 5 of the Quran, verses 90 through 94. Man, they also believe man is made from the dust of the earth. 23, verse 12. They also believe there's no last five, no last minute repentance. That means you don't have any choice at the last minute to make things right. Then there's five pillars of Islam. The five pillars of Islam are core beliefs that shape Muslim thought, deed, and society. A Muslim who fulfills the five pillars of Islam remains in the faith of Islam and sincerely repents of, sincerely repents of his sin will make it to Jannah, which is their paradise. If he performs the five pillars but does not remain in the faith, he will not be saved. The first pillar is called the Shahada. The Shahada is the Islamic proclamation that there is no true God except Allah and that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. This is the confession that Allah is the one and only true God. They believe Allah alone is worthy of worship and that Allah alone is the sovereign Lord who does what he wills with whomever he wills. It means that all his rules and laws found in the Quran are to be followed. It means that the Christian doctrine of God as a trinity is false, as are, as are all other belief systems, including pantheism. They believe Muhammad is the true and greatest prophet of Allah, and recognition of a Muhammad as the prophet of God is required. It was through Muhammad, they say, that Allah conveyed the last and final revelation. The second pillar of Islam is prayer, or the Salat. First of all, they believe that prayer involves confession of sins, which begins with the purification of the body and ends with the purification of the soul. They believe prayer is performed five times a day. The first prayer is at dawn and the last at sunset. Under prayer, they also, the second part is the names of the prayers are Fajr, Dehur, Asur, Maghrib, and Isha. The Maghrib prayer is the sunset prayer. Isha is the prayer that is said after sunset. There is also a prayer that is said right after Fajr, known as the Shurak. The third pillar of Islam is fasting. They believe that in the month of Ramadan is the month of fasting. It's an act of worship where the faithful followers deny their own needs and seek Allah. Usually, during these fasting, there will be no drinking, eating, or sexual relations during the daylight hours for the entire month of Ramadan. The fourth pillar of Islam is almsgiving or charity. This is about charity given to the poor. It benefits the poor and helps the giver by moving him towards more holiness and submission to Allah. Almsgiving is considered a form of worship to their God, Allah. The fifth, pil the fifth pillar is the pil pilgrimage or the Hajj. This is the pilgrimage to Mecca. All Muslims, if they are able, are to make a pilgrimage to Mecca. It involves financial sacrifice and is an act of worship. Muslims must make the pilgrimage the first half of the last month of the lunar year. Now, those are the five pillars of Allah, of Islam, excuse me. Now we're going to compare some of what they believe to what Christians believe. First of all, the afterlife. Christians believe that we will be with the Lord in heaven. Let's turn to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians, New Testament Philippians chapter 1. And we will read verses 
21 through 24. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what shall I choose, I wot not, or know not? For I am in a strait, between two, having a desire to part, and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. So he's letting us know that when he dies, to be a part would be with Christ, and we would be in our resurrected bodies. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 talks about the resurrected body. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If you've got your Bibles tonight, can I get an amen? Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And we will start with verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, that means die, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible, which means that part that can die, must put on incorruption. That means the part that can never die. And we, and this mortal, must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Verse 55 says, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be as steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And then it tells us, go to Matthew 25, 46. It says, non-Christians will be cast into hell forever. That is Matthew 25. Matthew 25. And 46. It says, and these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. How long is the punishment there? Everlasting. Now, what does Islam believe about the afterlife? In chapter 75, verse 12, it says its experience is either an ideal life of paradise for faithful Muslims or hell for those who are not. Now, Christianity also teaches about angels. Christianity teaches that created beings, non-human, some of which fell into sin and became evil. They are very powerful. The unfallen angels carry out the will of God. And the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, whereby his blood, excuse me, the unfallen angels carry out the will of God. Isn't that nice to know? Now, Islam believes that these are created beings without free will that serve God and that angels were created from light. Well, I'm here to tell you that Satan named Lucifer was an angel in heaven and he did rebel and he took a third of his angels with him and they were cast out of heaven so angels have a will they have a free will and they can do what they want not what Islam says the Bible says it's opposite now what does it say about the atonement now the atonement means the price paid for sin now in 1 Peter 2:24. The sacrifice of Christ on the cross, whereby his blood becomes a sacrifice that turns away the wrath of God. Now, let's turn to 1 Peter 2.24. 1 Peter 2.24. Are you with me tonight? Say amen. amen. It says, Who 
rule, speaking of Jesus Christ, his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live under righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. Praise God for that. And also that his sacrifice turns away the wrath of God. Turn to first John. First John before Revelation. First John chapter two. And we will begin with verse two. And he is a propitiation for our sins, and not ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. That means he's the one that made the payment for sin for the whole world. But it's up to the world to believe. And it says also, it turns a sinner, when the sinner receives Christ, turn what it, the atonement is theirs. John chapter 1, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, John, excuse me, John verse, chapter 1, verse 12. It says, but as many as received him, speaking of Jesus, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, that's little s, even to them that believe on his name. When you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, on that name, you become born again, and your sins are paid. And it comes through faith. Turn to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. And we will look at verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. I like the word justified. It means just as if I never sinned. Jesus paid for the sin, and we believe on that, and because of that, we have peace with God. Now, the, the nation of Islam believes there's no atonement work in Islam other than a sincere confession of sin and repentance by the, by the sinner. That's a big difference than what the Bible says, isn't it? Let's see what they say about the Bible. Christians believe that the Bible is the inspired and errant word of God in the original manuscripts. Turn to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy. And we will read, we will go to chapter 3. And we will read verse 16. It says, all scripture. How much? All. all. Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Verse 17 says that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So all scripture, all the way from Genesis to the book of Revelation, is the Bible. Now, Islam believes but it's a respected word of the prophets, but that the Bible has been corrupted through centuries and is only correct insofar as it agrees with the Quran. Well, I tell you, God says that his word was forever preserved. And in the 1940s, they found scrolls in a cave over in Israel, and books of Isaiah and other books were there, and they're exactly the same as they are today. God preserves his word forever. It's not corrupted. There's some translations that I think are better than others, but his word is not corrupted. What about the crucifixion? Christians believe that the place where Jesus atoned for the sins of the world and that it is only through this sacrifice that anyone can be saved from the wrath of God. In 1 Peter 2.24, 1 Peter 2.24, we read... Praise the Lord. If you're there, say amen. amen. We read it earlier, but it says, Who his own self for our sins and his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live under righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. There had to be a crucifixion in order for this to happen. Islam does not believe that Jesus died on the cross. Instead, they, they believe God allowed Judas to look like Jesus, and he was crucified instead. What mockery. It's terrible. What does the Bible say about the devil? The Bible tells us that the devil is a fallen angel who opposes God in all ways, and he also seeks to destroy humanity. 
Turn to Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14. And we will begin with verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heavens of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. And turn to Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 28. And we will read verses 13 through 15. This is speaking of Lucifer, Satan. Ezekiel 28, 13. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God, speaking of Satan. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sargias, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper. The sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. And I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created, till iniquity was found in thee. So you see the devil's full of iniquity. What do they believe about the devil? They call him Iblis, a fallen jinn. Jinn are not angels nor men, but created beings with free wills. Jinn was created from fire. Well, that's certainly contradictory to what the Bible says. Now, what about God? Christianity teaches that God is a trinity of persons, the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. The trinity is not three gods in one God, nor is it one person took three forms. Trinitarianism is strictly monotheistic. There is no other God in existence. There is one God represented in three persons. Now, Islam believes that God is known as Allah, that Allah is one person, a strict unity. There's no other God in existence. He's the creator of the universe. That comes to the Quran, chapter 3, verse 191, and he's sovereign over all. That isn't what the Word of God teaches us. It teaches that Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, and that he created all things. Now, let's see what they say about heaven. Christians believe that heaven is the place where God dwells. Can I get an amen? Amen. And that heaven is the eventual home of the Christians who are saved by God's grace. Can I get an amen? Amen. It's heaven because it's where God is. Amen. Amen. And Christians will enjoy <coughs> eternal fellowship with him. Amen. Now, Islam believes there's a paradise to Muslims. It's a place of unimaginable bliss. It's a garden with trees and food where the desires of faithful Muslims are met. That's a little contradictory. I believe when we're in heaven, we're still going to be learning things because God knows all and he'll teach us all. Now, what does a Christian believe about hell? We believe that hell is a place of torment and it's in fire out of the presence of God. There's no escape from hell. Matthew 25, 46. Let's turn there again, please. Matthew 25, verse 46. Let's start with verse 45. Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you did it not to one of the least of these, you did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Also, there's a story in the Word of God about the rich man and Lazarus. And they both died. One went into Abraham's bosom, the other one went into hell. And there was fire, and there was torment there. There is a real hell, and most cults don't believe in it. But because they don't believe in the truth, they will end up in hell if they don't repent. Now, this is what the Muslims believe through the Islam, that hell is a place of eternal punishment and torment and fire for those who are not Muslims, as well as those who were and whose works and faith were not sufficient. Wow. They don't believe anybody can 
go to heaven but them, and that you and I, if we're not a Muslim, would go to hell. It's certainly contrary to what God says. I know I'm not going to hell because the, Lord, the word of God says, we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Saved from what? Saved from hell. Praise God for that. Now let's see what they say about the Holy Spirit. Christians believe that the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity and that the Holy Spirit is fully God in nature. He's all God. Amen. Now what do they believe about the Holy Spirit? They believe that the Archangel Gabriel who delivered the words of the Quran to Muhammad is the Holy Spirit. My goodness, that's blasphemy. That's blasphemy. Now what do they believe about Jesus? We touched on a little bit. Christians believe that he's the second person of the Trinity. He's a word that became flesh. John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the word, that word is Logos, and the word was with God, that's Kyrios, and the word, Logos, became flesh. Praise God. He is God. And then he's also both God and man. Colossians chapter 2, let's go there in 9. See, Jesus laid his glory down to come to earth, but he still is all God and all man. And what he did on earth was as the man God. Let's turn to Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, and it says, For in him, let's start verse 8, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments or principles of the world and not after Christ. For in him, speaking of Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So Jesus is God in the flesh. Now they believe that Jesus was a great prophet, second only to Muhammad, but that Jesus is not the Son of God and certainly is not divine and he was not crucified. Well, that's one of the main inherents for the Christian faith is that Jesus was God in the flesh, that he was sinless, that he died on the cross for our sin, and that he rose again from the dead. And that's what gives us the ability to become Christians because he paid for our sin debt with his blood. Praise God he was crucified, but praise God even more, he rose from the dead. Amen? Now this is what the Christian believes about Judgment Day. We believe that it occurs on the day of resurrection. Let's look at John chapter 12, verse 48. John chapter 12, 48. It says, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judges him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Who's the word? Jesus Christ. The word became flesh. And where God will judge all people, Christians will go to heaven, and we read just a moment ago that all others will go to hell. And what do they believe about Judgment Day? They believe it occurs on the day of resurrection where God will judge all people. Muslims go to paradise, and all others go to hell. And judgment's based on a person's deeds. And this all comes out of the Quran, chapter 5, verse 9, chapter 42, 26, and 8, verse 29. That what do they believe about, what do Christians believe about the Quran? They believe that the Quran is the work of Muhammad, that it's not inspired, nor is it scripture. There is no verification for its accurate transmission from the originals. And what do they believe when you're in Islam? They believe it's the final revelation of God to all of mankind, given through the archangel Gabriel to Muhammad over a 23 year period that it's without error and guarded from error by Allah. Well, that's not what the Word of God says. Now, what does God say about man? In Genesis 1.26, it says that man was made in the image of God. This does not mean that God is a body, but that man is made like God in his abilities to reason, to have faith, to love, etc. What do the Islams believe? They believe that man was not made in the image of God, that man was made out of the dust of the earth in their Quran chapter 23, 12, and that Allah breathed life into man. That came from chapter 32, verse 9. What do, they, what do Christians believe about Muhammad? Christian believes he was a non-inspired man born in 570 in Mecca who started the Islamic religion. And what did the Islam believe about Muhammad? 
They believe he was the last and the greatest of all prophets of Allah, whose Quran is the greatest of all inspired books. What about original sin? Christians believe this is a term used to describe the effect of Adam's sin on his descendants. In Romans chapter 5, we will read chapter 5, verses 12 to 23. Romans 5, 12. If you're there, give me a great amen. 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 It says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed, or no account is kept, when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come, but not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift of grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, and hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift, for the judgment was by one to condemnation. But the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if one man's offense, deaths, reigned by one, speaking of Adam, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in the life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Wow, that's quite a mouthful compared to what others have said, amen? All right, now, in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 3, it talks about our sinful nature. Let's read there. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3. If you're there, say, praise the, Lord. praise the Lord. It says, Among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. So see, we're born with original sin. We have the nature of wrath in us. Now, what does Islam believe? They believe there is no original sin that all people are sinless unless they rebel against God. They do not have sinful natures. Well, it says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God in Romans 6.23. What about the resurrection? Christians believe that the bodily res resurrection of all people, non-Christians to damnation, and Christians are res resurrected to eternal life. In 1 Corinthians chapter 50, that's 1 Corinthians chapter 50, excuse me, 15, verses 50 through 58, it says, now this, we read this earlier, but I'm going to read it again. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, that means to die, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trump shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. So see, the moment that trumpet sounds, we're going to be changed and incorruptible. We're going to shake off all that old sin nature, be resurrected. We also believe in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 9, it's a free gift of God. It said, by grace are you saved through faith, and that's not of yourself. It is the gift of God, lest any man should boast. Now, what do they believe about the bodily resurrection? They believe that 
Some go to heaven and some go to hell. That forgiveness of sin is obtained by Allah's grace without a mediator. There doesn't have to be a go-between like Jesus. The Muslim must believe that Allah exists. They must believe in the fundamental doctrines of Islam and believe that Muhammad is his prophet and follow the commands of Allah in the Quran. Then, what about the Son of God? This is a term to use. It was designated that Jesus is divine, though he's not the literal Son of God in a physical sense. Now, that, that means that God the Father didn't give birth to him. The Son of God is a term that Jesus used. He also called himself the Son of Man. It had to be a man that came to redeem us back. It had to be a near kinsman. It had to be a real person, not just a ghost or something like that. He had a real body. And let's read John chapter 5, verse 18. John 5, 18. It says, Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. All right, Jesus said that. What do they believe about the Son of God in the Islam faith? There's a literal Son of God, therefore Jesus cannot be the Son of Allah. Hmm. What about the Trinity? We went over that a minute ago. There's one God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the Word of God teaches us that. And they believe that the Trinity is the Father, Jesus, and Mary. Isn't that interesting? Hmm. What about the Word of God? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, Christians say, in John 1, 1. And the Word was God, and verse 14 says, The Word, which is Logos, became flesh and dwelt among us. Now, Islam believes that Allah's command of existence was resulted in Jesus being formed in the womb of Mary. Now, these are some of the things I believe. There's a whole lot more. And they really are strong in what they believe. They will fight for it. They will kill for it. There's radical. There's some not so radical. But what about us as Christians? Do we have enough of God in us to propagate what is truth? Are you willing to get out and share your faith with others, letting them know what the real way is? Are you witnessing to those that don't know Jesus? Are you witnessing to those that are in some of these cults that we've been studying? It's so important that they hear the truth. And only faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So we must share our faith, people. We must let them know the truth. And we never hate the person. You hate the sin in a person, but you don't ever hate a person. That's the difference, too, between us and Islam. They're taught to hate everything. We're taught to love. It says, God loved us in John 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And we live for God because God gave his life. We don't have to give up our life physically in order to make God pleased we gave up our life of sin when God gave us the opportunity to become his children. Praise God that we can be born again into the kingdom and that we can study the word of God like we are tonight and be set free. God bless each one of you.